Hello and welcome to Revision Tips for SIPS Level 4, Diploma in Procurement and Supply. This is Module 1, Scope and Influence of Procurement and Supply, and it's Learning Outcome 1, to understand and analyse the added value that can be achieved through procurement and supply chain management. So here we're looking at the definitions of procurement and supply. We need to describe the categories of spend that an organisation may purchase. So let's look at some key definitions. Added value. That's the addition to a feature or capability for which the buyer is prepared to pay extra. The cost is the amount that has to be paid or spent to buy or obtain something. Inventory can consist of raw materials, work in progress, as well as finished goods. Logistics is the commercial activity of transporting goods to customers. And purchasing is the action of acquiring goods for the buying organisation. Quality is the standard of something as measured against something similar. And supply refers to the movement of materials and goods through channels to the end user. Waste management are the activities and actions that require to be managed, moving waste from its inception to its final disposal. <clears throat> so in, in relation to organisational costs, some will be fixed, variable, direct or indirect. So direct procurements, the sourcing and supply of a product or service that is directly related to a specific job. So an example might be raw materials that are used to produce a product. These procurements are integral to the organisation. Without them, there can be no finished product to sell to the customer. What about construction? They need bricks, cement, timber and labour. Indirect procurements are the goods and services that an organisation needs in order to continue functioning. But they don't necessarily contribute to the bottom line. So examples will include the wages for your support staff, the office rent, your mobile phone contract. And although these are important to the organisation, indirect procurements can often be sourced from different suppliers. And so supply relationships can be very different from those of a direct and core procurement. A variable cost is a corporate expense that changes in proportion to production output. So this will be linked to the directs. So variable costs will increase or decrease depending on the company's production volume. They rise as the production increases and fall as the production decreases. So these will be your raw materials and packaging. But the total expenses that's incurred by any business will consist of fixed and variable costs. These fixed costs are the expenses that remain the same, regardless of the production output. And it's also whether a firm makes a sale or not. It must pay its fixed costs as these costs are independent of any output. So examples of these fixed costs, which are indirects, are rent, employee salaries, insurance and office supplies. So a company will always need to pay its rent for the space it occupies to run its business, irrespective of the volumes it sells. And although fixed costs can change over time, the change will not be in relation to the production output, whereas variable costs and directs are dependent on the production output. So direct procurement is a process of requiring resources that is going into building the actual product or service the business is offering. So let's go, go for another example like a smartphone. The manufacturing organisation would need to acquire resources such as the, the microchips and processors, the screen. All of these things are directly related to offering that phone. So for a product-based business, both direct and indirect procurements complement each other and create a balance for a smooth functioning of an operation. They help organisations generate revenue and shape the consumer experience. 
because they have the power to create or damage an organization's reputation. It receives more visibility and will be a larger share of investment concerning resources. If you compare indirect procurement with direct procurement, the latter requires spending more money up front. Now, indirect procurement is the process of acquiring resources that support the ongoing existence of a business. So if we go back to that example of the smartphone, if your organisation is creating that, you may want to create apps, which would require little resources by way of direct procurement because it's more people. But they may still need resources through indirect procurement like office supplies and systems and so on. Now, the indirect direct procurements require spending on a case by case basis. Indirect procurement helps you to operate smoothly and usually gets decentralised in nature. It receives lesser visibility and a proportionally low share of investment concerning resources. So for a service based business, indirect procurements play a more prominent role compared to directs. Now, all organisations cost or expense is the cost incurred to run a company. And a business may incur a number of costs as it's forming or growing. And these are considered the cost of doing business. So, for example, you'll need to acquire a building, equipment, materials and utilities. Now, cost is an economic measure that sums all expenses paid to a product or to produce that product. Even to purchase an investment or acquire a piece of equipment. When using it to define production costs, it measures the fixed variable and expenses associated with producing a good. This is a fundamental concept for business executives because it allows them to track back the combined cost for their operation. And it allows the individuals to make pricing and revenue decisions based on whether the total costs are increasing or decreasing. Furthermore, interesting individuals can dig into the total cost numbers to separate them to find fixed costs and variable costs and adjust operations according to the lower overall cost of production. But here on the screen, you can see that about 60% of a typical organisation would be spent on raw materials. We're now going to look at the difference between stock and non-stock procurements. Stock procurements are things that are listed in inventories. They are things like raw materials and components or even finished goods. So raw materials are extracted from the natural source by the primary sector. So it's things like cotton and coal and fish and rubber and wheat. Components are manufactured by the secondary sector. They've taken the raw materials from the primary sector and created components that can be sold. So they're things like nuts and bolts and parts that will go into a finished good. The finished goods are stocked by a retail store and they sell these to the consumers. They need to be managed carefully in order to keep inventory as cost effective as possible. Effective stock control can save organisation huge sums of money. Stock procurement means that goods are shipped to stock periodically. They don't necessarily link to a specific order from the customer. This important premise is that the demand can be forecasted. When finishing the production process, goods will be stocked up until the next order is received from the customer. One way of applying stock procurement by the customer is to define the minimum stock levels. If the stock levels fall below the defined limit, the procurement process is initiated. This type of procurement offers high flexibility to the customer, but the procurement costs tend to be higher. So let's look at non-stock now. Non-stock procurements are not stored within the organisation, so you cannot list it 
in inventory. Generally speaking, they're intangible and they're used to help run an organisation. Maybe a one-off purchase, often capital purchases. You need an understanding of this term. Capital purchases relate to assets, so things that your business will keep for a long time. And an intangible thing is something that you don't necessarily touch and feel or result in any ownership. It's just as important to get value for money when procuring non-stocks as it is to stocks. So here we've got some examples like cleaning services, telephony systems, or an internet contract, your insurance, or an advertising campaign. In contrast to the stock procurement, there is no system sided inventory booking in for the relevant stock of products or procurements. These products are not intended for further sale to a customer or as assets or as parts of an application for a potential production process that are usually used internally. The Crowdjet matrix. This is used to assess the importance and risks associated with the procurements you're making. It determines how to manage the supplier relationships for direct procurements effectively. The direct procurements are usually supported by strategic or leveraged suppliers due to their importance and risk profile. As a result, they must be managed well by the buyers who are responsible for them. Indirect procurements of intangible services are likely to be sourced from a leverage or routine supplier. The relationship with these suppliers are not as strong as the strategic suppliers and may involve simply paying for the service rather than establishing long term working relationships. So have a think about some examples of the direct and indirect procurements that you may or may not have made or envisaged that you'll be making in the future. Then determine the risk and importance of each of those procurements within an organisation that you know. And then determine the type of relationship that should be applied to each of those procurements. If it costs lots of money and is a high risk, they should be sitting in the strategic box. High cost but low risk will be leverage. Low cost, low risk is routine. And the interesting one is the one that we don't spend a huge amount of money on, but the risk is really high. The bottleneck supplies. It's usually when we have a monopoly supplier in the market. They're the only ones that you can buy it from. We're now going to look at the difference between CAPEX and OPEX. CAPEX are capital purchases. They're purchases of an asset for your organisation, such as machinery, buildings or land. They're procured to help a business develop, make money and continue to keep up with market trends. The value of capital purchases reduces over time and this is reflected in the organisational budget. The amount by which the asset reduces is known as depreciation. That can be a fully depreciated asset or partially depreciated where it's worth some money at the end. But the procurement professional needs to work out the fight with the finance department how quickly the asset may depreciate. Operational expenditure is known as um, OPEX and it's for ongoing expenses that ensure the efficient day-to-day -day running of business. It's usually paid monthly or annually and will have a low to medium value. But it does include rents, raw materials and salaries as well as insurance and transport. So just to recap, CAPEX refers to capital expenditure where OPEX refers to operational. Capital is incurred when a business acquires an asset that could be beneficial beyond the current tax year. So for instance, if they buy a new piece of equipment or a building, it will be remaining within the business for longer than a year.
The operational expenditure are those expenses that a business incurs to run smoothly. Now procuring service can have its challenges as products cannot be specifically measured and therefore precisely described. They do not have a specific weight, colour, material and composition. And while it might seem that documenting the specification and requirements for services is akin to writing a job description, the person delivering the service may never see set foot in your office or meet your team. They'll not have the opportunity to observe and learn, but still must perform and get the task done to generate the outcome that the company needs. Now, unless the service in question are covering specific hours of the day, the number of resources or hours required is likely to be associated with the outcome. So you're making a leap from what outcome is uh, to headcount, let alone specific skills and qualifications that, that require a deep understanding of the service and the value it offers to the business. But here are the characteristics of um, services. So generally they're, they're referred to as intangible because you can't touch them and, and, and compare one with the other. There's an inseparability, which means that quite often you can't um, separate the service provider from the service. The purchaser has to participate in the production. There's an opportunity for these services to perish because you can't store it for use at a later date. Like a train ticket, you know, if you bought a train ticket that was leaving tomorrow, which is ultimately a service that the train company is providing to you, and you miss that train, you can't then take another train. It's perished, it's gone. So they're often very time sensitive. There's an element of variability because services are difficult to control and standardise. There's a people element. Um, so it's likely that you could have a service, a really good service one day and not so well the next. And it does require customer contact far more than, um, than the goods. We're now going to look at the five rights that should always be considered when making a purchase. We need the right price, quantity, quality, time and place. The right price covers the factors that can affect all of the, uh, all of the rest of the um, five rights, such as quality and quantity. It's quite a, um, an elastic one out of all of these because they can pull on the price. Quality refers to quality standards. Make sure it's not too high or not too low. Quantity could link to economies of scale. You know, the, the, more, the more you buy, the cheaper it is, but it'll have a, a knock-on effect to your inventory approach. And in terms of the time, you need to make sure it comes in during your warehouse opening hours, but also on the right day. Procurement's objectives and analysis, analysis of the procurement function are normally set against these five rights. And over the years, this approach has been highly successful. But as the role of procurement develops, so does the interpretation of these five rights. The quality traditionally referred to the quality of the product or service being offered and the standards required. Quantity always dictated that the buyer should buy the right quantity. Too much or too little could result in higher costs or unfulfilled orders. And price is important to everyone and not least procurement. But procurement professionals are taught to aim for a competitive price. Place has usually been referred to as delivering to the right place or the last mile is a term used by supply chain management and transportation planning to describe the movement of goods and services from a hub to a final destination. And time waits for no man. We no longer want to be considered to wait for the time of delivery as the only aspect of time that needs to be considered is when. And in terms of the right place, it needs to have the correct address as well as a contact for somebody. Now specifications are an integral part of procurement and I often refer to them as the heart of a contract. 
but there are two types of specifications. Performance, also known as outcome focused, and conformance, known as technical specifications. We'll start with the performance specifications first. They outline what a product or service is to do or achieve, which will allow for an innovation. Providers can choose how to make it work rather than you know, following a specific process. It allows for various options of a requirement to be considered and therefore promotes innovation and competition in the marketplace. They're known as output or outcome based and often used for facilities management, like starting a cleaning contract that an office should be kept free of rubbish. With a performance spec, the buyer describes what's expected from the product that would be able to achieve in terms of functions and the level of performance it should reach. It's up to the supplier really to furnish a product or service that will satisfy these requirements. The buyer specifies the ends and the supplier has the relative flexibility as a means of achieving those ends. Performance specification are easier and cheaper to draft compared to a more detailed prescriptive conformance approach. The success of the specification does not depend on the technical knowledge of the buyer. Suppliers may well know better than the buyer what's required and how it can be best satisfied. A greater share of specification risk is borne by the supplier. If the, buyers, um, if the part supplied do not perform to the function that's been required by the buyer or it doesn't achieve the target outcome. So what about conformance specs? This details exactly what the product or service is made of, like a recipe. The responses to a conformance spec, on the other hand, should have identical offerings. You'll often see this in pharmaceuticals and agriculture. With a conformance spec, the buyer details exactly what's required from the product and what it must consist of. So it could be like an engineering drawing or a blueprint or a sample of a product that needs to be duplicated. The supplier may not know the detail or even at all what the function of the product will play, quite different to the performance spec. But the supplier's task is to simply conform to the description provided by the buyer. The two main categories of specification are conformance and technical. You should really need to know that you should know the difference between a conformance spec and a performance spec. In terms of the risks, in a conformance spec, the buyer is going to bear all of the risks of the design. The supplier who just conforms to the letter of the description are safeguarded, even if the product doesn't actually perform what it was intended to do. So if the specification is limited, vague or inaccurate or incompatible with other elements of the buyer's processes, the work may conform to the spec, but not to the right quality or fit for purpose. And the prescriptive nature of the specification may restrict innovation in a range of solution problems. It's particularly a problem if the specification details the means by which the supplied item should be manufactured. Your buyer is potentially closing itself off from manufacturing developments of which they may be unaware. So let's think of some examples of each. I mean, conformance are generally products. So if you were asking for a particular make and model of a toner cartridge that was going to fit into a printer, then it would be a conformance spec. But you may decide to buy some paper to go into that printer that you don't really care what the brand is, um, but you'd still have a technical specification in terms of the, the color, the weight, the, the size, so it'd still be considered a conformance spec. But in terms of who services that machine, that's just a performance, isn't it? It's about getting it up and running and clearing a paper jam. That can be done as a performance or outcome focused specification. You're not saying who does it, you're not saying how they do it, you're just specifying the outcome. We're now going to move on to um, the total cost of acquisition and the total cost of ownership. So the total cost of acquisition relates to the amount of money an organisation has to pay to acquire a product 
from sourcing through to receiving and installing. It takes in account the purchase price, the quality of the product. So the lower quality could give a cheaper purchase price but cause problems with defects or not being fit for purpose, which could cost more in the long run. It will include the cost of carriage and insurance and transporting the product to the required destination and ensuring there's valid insurance. The lead times, which is the amount of time it takes for the product to arrive, including manufacturing and transportation. And then the total cost of ownership, also known as the life cycle cost. It's used to analyse the total cost that will be incurred over the lifetime of the goods or services you're buying. To be honest, it's often used when you're procuring assets, so going back to the capex requirements. Because it will look at things like tooling and insurance, the operating costs, the maintenance, the cost of training, storage, but also disposal of that asset. Now, calculating your total cost of ownership and total cost of acquisition will help to show which option presents the best overall value for money for your organisation. So here's an example. Where total cost of ownership has been detailed in the specification, the evaluation should take into account all of the identified cost attributed to that product or service from acquisition through to use, maintenance and end of life. There'll be direct costs, for example, the maintenance and the energy used. But in the case of total cost of ownership, it will be less apparent about things like environmental costs, the cost of emissions and greenhouse gases based on the energy used on the forklift truck you can see on the screen. The total cost of ownership does highlight the difference between the purchase price and the long-term cost. The analysis came into spotlight in the mid-1980s due to expenses in supporting hardware and software acquisitions. Managers discovered that supporting the equipment and software could cost between five and eight times the purchase price. Once the difference between the cost of ownership and price came to light, companies began to take advantage of this calculation for a number of different capital investment decisions, including buildings, vehicles, manufacturing equipment and information technology. There are a number of different ways this analysis can be useful for decision makers. It will help to make critical lease versus buy comparisons. Should you buy a product, should you lease it? And by incorporating this into the acquisition process, it directly impacts the outcome in vendor selection, prioritisation of capital acquisition and overall corporate budgeting. We're now going to look at the elements that are covered in a contract. Contracts are legal agreements between two or more parties. It's legally binding and contracts must have essential elements in order to enforce in court. An offer, an acceptance, consideration, intention and capacity. Some contracts that are missing one, of the, one or two of these elements will not hold up in court but it's best to have all things covered. A contract differs to each specific requirement. However, a short, simple contract may work just as well for your needs. It does depend on the job, but at the very least, a contract should include the basics, such as a description of services, the payment and completion terms, and a dispute resolution clause. Now, procurement departments may purchase products and services from internal or external suppliers. Prior to contracting, the buyer will evaluate their suppliers to determine which ones offer the best fit to their specification. A legally binding contract is then drawn up and it outlines what should happen when the five rights of procurement are not supplied 
and it's there to ensure that both the buyer and supplier have the same understanding of the requirements of those five rights. And KPIs can help with this. They, they're key performance indicators, which set the targets for the most important factors that need to be achieved. They can relate to quality, time, quantities and place considerations. So linking this back to the five rights. They should be included in contracts so they form part of the agreement. And performance can be monitored and compared to KPIs to assess if a supplier is meeting them. Now these um, KPIs can either be qualitative or quantitative, but they must be measurable. So examples of qualitative KPIs may be things like reducing the number of factory rejects, achieving ISO accreditation, and reducing material wastage during manufacture. The quantitative KPIs could be things like reducing the percentage of late deliveries, ensuring that orders are received with the correct quantities, and trying to increase the percentage of deliveries to the correct location. Your KPIs should be assessed regularly and the supplier's performance should be discussed with them at review meetings. So have a think about some of the KPIs that your organisation has with its suppliers. What do these KPIs tell you about what's important to your organisation? The ultimate benefit of key performance indicators is the ability to measure the results of your actions, which are often undertaken based on assumptions. While research can help you to take an educated guess and reduce your risks, it's important to set KPIs to help you increase or stop activities that create better or worse than expected results. Identifying the vital indicators of a company's success will help you establish accurate performance targets. So for example, the number of customers you may have that are not as important as the total revenue your sales generates. Measuring your company's success through achieved goals is an aid to analysing areas where your business excels and where it can be improved. If you rely on only, only on figures that re represent your sales revenue, you may not know what you can do to do a better job. Setting performance targets can be disadvantage, disadvantageous too, especially if your company doesn't follow up on the progress. You must assess if your indicators are met by your employees, company-wide, and in comparison with your competitors. Review your goals to determine if you must adjust them based on factors such as the economy, new products, or any other reason that impacts on your ability to meet your targets. Now, adding value is the equivalent to the increase in value that a business creates by undertaking the production process. It's quite easy to think of some examples of how a production process can add value. such as additional features or a brand name, giving you the convenience, providing you excellent service, developing the market, reducing the costs, building a positive reputation, being innovative and providing sustainability. Now adding value is the difference between the price of the finished goods and services and the costs of the inputs involved in making it. So let's consider an example of new cars rolling down the production line being assembled by robots. The final completed and shiny new car that comes off the production line has a value that is more, or that, that is more than the cost of the sum of the parts. Value has been added. Exactly how much is determined by the price the customer is willing to pay. Alternatively, imagine a celebrity chef preparing a meal at his luxury restaurant. Once the cooking is complete, the meal is served and sold for a high price. Substantially more than the cost of buying the ingredients. Therefore, value has been added. Now, sustainability is the ability to continue a, def a defined behaviour indefinitely. 
It can be seen as the ability to be maintained at a certain rate or level and avoidance of the depletion of natural resources in order to maintain an ecological balance. This leads us to focus on maintaining the level of commitment to avoidance of the depletion of resources. This focus on sustainability highlights the growing awareness that we don't have much control over environmental issues and everyone wants to go immediately into problem solving mode. The focus has created a state of increased alertness. People who are environmentally aware and extremely sensitive to their surroundings. They're alert to the hidden dangers associated with poor co corporate social responsibility. And on the screen here, you can see the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which we've committed to achieving by 2030. I like the way it's depicted by um, images rather than just words. So hopefully it will help you to remember some of these like you no know, poverty or hunger. Good health, well-being and education. Gender equality, clean water, affordable energy, decent work innovation, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities, responsible consumption, climate action, life below water and on land, peace, justice and strong institutions and partnership for the goals. Achieving value for money can be described as using public resources in a way that creates and maximises public value. The use of public resources is defined as public sector capital and resource expenditure, the stewardship of assets and raising revenue. This means that value for money is considered at a national level, not just in terms of how it will affect the local vicinity. This ensures that the assessment focuses on the impacts of a proposal that is additional to the overall public value. So we don't just look at the cost, we look at exchange rates and environmental factors and freight and maintenance, all the stuff that perhaps we've seen already with the um, whole co uh, total cost of ownership. Now value for money in procurement is achieved through pursuing the lowest cost and that's the whole life cost, clearly defining relevant benefits and delivering on time. Preventing waste and fostering competition, transparency and accountability during your tender process are key conditions to achieving value for money. So consider value for money throughout the entire procurement process, including the investment in upfront planning, giving guidance and undertaking early engagement, including value for money in your objectives and outcomes, evaluating the offers and selecting the offer that demonstrates the best overall value for money, and then driving value for money throughout the life of the contract. And here you can see some of the ways you can achieve it. So from quality, it doesn't need to be the best, it just needs to be fit for purpose. For quantities, you need to get the right order quantities, not too much, not too little. Work with a supplier that's got a good reputation and get things done on time. A warranty is also a good way to get added value because it's a promise by, made by the supplier to repair or replace a product that stops working within an agreed period of time. We're now going to look at supply chains. And many authors have commented on the operation of supply chains and their close links between suppliers and buyers and how raw materials are converted into end products through the operation of a supply chain. The change of the idea of how supply chain works has been a huge shift for procurement and has firmly placed procurement's role central to orchestrating these relationships. The more holistic view of the supply chain has emphasised the need to break down functional boundaries so material related activity can be integrated into a single management framework. This emphasises the need for joined up thinking about the flows of information, materials, services and other inputs to improve speed and efficiency and thus competitiveness. So Handel and Nichols say a supply chain encompasses organisation and activities 
associated with transformation of goods from raw materials to an end user. Bailey says supply chain involve all, the, in, all those involved in organising or converting materials. It's the cycle of transformation that's repeated several times before goods reach the end customer. And you have a dyadic relationship, which is a simple relationship between two people. So a firm has a dyadic relationship with their supplier and a separate dyadic relationship with their customer. A supply chain implies that two parties are in a commercial relationship. This point to point type of relationship can be considered dyadic and was very much the form of commercial relationships in the past where parties were only concerned by the issues impacting their immediate neighbour in the supply chain. But processes such as SRM and CRM have been used to support these relationships. SRM is supply relationship management and CRM is customer relationship management. But these point to point relationships occur within much longer and complex change. So, for example, an extractor such as a quarry supplier supplies stone to a processing plant, a stone cutter which supplies to a manufacturer who then produces stone tiles for the floor, who supplies to a retailer who then sells to a customer. This series of relationships is called an intra, sorry, inter-business supply chain, which is a linked sequence of contributors in different firms. There are several definitions to the supply chain concept of which Martin Christopher provided one of them. He is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport and a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply. In 1988, he was awarded the Sir Lawrence, Robert Lawrence Gold Medal for his contributions to logistics education. And in 97, he was given the USA Council of Logistic Management Foundation Award. And again in 20, 2005, he received a Distinguished Service Award from the US Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals. Then in 2007, appointed as a Foundation Professor for SIPS and awarded the Institute Swin, Swin Bank Award for Lifetime Achievement. So you can see on this diagram that in a basic supply chain, a producer will extract the raw materials, provide it to the producers who then manufacture it, deliver it to the, the customer. So when it's going um, towards the manufacturer, it's going upstream. And once it becomes finished goods, it travels downstream. The perception of a supply chain is, lo is losing way to the realization that supply is not linear as in a chain, but it's much more complex like a network. But it still has a number of certain characteristics. The implications of this metaphor include the need to coordinate activities across supply chains to maximise flow, um, maximize flow and effectiveness, <clears throat> establish mutual and maintain good relationships. Carefully structure your supply chain activities to maintain control and minimise risk, as well as minimising cost. Select suppliers based on their own competitiveness within the supply chain and work collaboratively with supply chain members to secure added value, cost and quality improvements. So these characteristics, the, the serial cooperation is that each player works together in turn. There's a mutual dependency and linkages between those relationships. But ultimately, it needs to be continuous. Each element can be regarded as focal for the purposes of analysis. So supply chains can show how raw materials are manufactured and delivered to a consumer. A supply chain network is an extension of the supply chain. It shows the link between various organisations involved in the entire supply chain process rather than just one element, including all parties. 
and the managing flows, which can be physical goods, tangible materials, as well as information flow and monetary flow of payments. Another way to look at this as well is to see how um, a supply chain is, net, um, is looked as a network, but also the additional facilities that are needed to make that happen. I mean, you know, if your focal firm in the middle will buy from a supplier who sells to a customer, but they've then got their suppliers and the suppliers suppliers as well as customers possibly have customers customers. But nothing actually happens without the need for things like IT and need procurement, transport, finance, and even the market research. So each of these parties has a range of services they use to deliver their operation. Even a simple supply chain network can begin, begin to look very complex when it's viewed in this way. Now procurement is the process of getting goods the company needs in order to fulfill its business model. And some of those tasks involved in the procurement process include developing standards of quality, financing purchases and creating purchase orders as well as negotiating prices, buying the goods, controlling the inventory and disposal of waste like packaging. In the overall supply chain process procurement stop once your company has possession of the goods. But supply chain management consists of everybody involved in getting the products in hand of the customer It'll include the raw material gatherings, the manufacturing, the transport companies, the warehouse and the staff, and all the tasks and functions that contribute towards moving that product. So procurement is the process of getting the goods you need, while supply chain management is the infrastructure needed to get those goods. A supply chain involves a process of moving the goods from the providers, from raw materials through to the finished products to the end consumer. It's a logistical method that manages the entire process. The organisation structure of a supply chain determines how they accomplish these goals, the need for and complexity of supply chains, which leaves organisations with a decision to make on how they would prefer their supply chain to be structured. The principle is known as network design. And the major questions are, how should the network be configured? The question relates to consideration about how the network needs to be best organised for the needs of the organisation. Where should each part of the network be owned? And the question here relates to the location of each of the networks, such as nearshoring or offshoring. Are there significant implications to how a network will operate as a result of these decisions? And what capability should each part of the network have? considering the capacity and capability of each element in the network. So on the top, you can see a traditional model where the top level purchaser seeks to add most value in the supply chain by understanding the manufacturing and undertaking that manufacturing of some of the products. But they'll need to manage relationships associated with six suppliers. This structure is acceptable in most organisations, but as the number of suppliers grows, there may be a need to consider tiering. Tiering suppliers is a form of supply-based management in which suppliers are organised such that only the first tier supplier deal directly with the buying organisation, and the second tier will part participate in the same supply chain, but will supply the first tier who either assemble or integrate before buying and supplying to the, to the buying organisation. This practice, practice originally um, came into its own in the, I can't remember when, but it's, it's to do with the automotive industry, allowing car assemblies to reduce the first tier supply chain to below a thousand suppliers. The practice allows the development of dif differentiated supply relationships with a small community of suppliers. A typical supply chain has become much more complex over the years as manufacturing expands globally. Production lean times have become longer as products continue to diversify 
and as a result, the need to improve supply chain operation, speed and accuracy is great. The complexity reflects the need for visibility in order to optimise one's supply chain performance. Now supply chains and their management is often concerned with demand side and dealing with supplies that go upstream. But as we saw on the previous slide, there is also an action of distributing goods to the customer. This creates an additional requirement of managing supply chains known as logistics management. It's concerned with moving and handling the goods in the supply chain. It's a supply chain component that is used to meet customer demands through the planning, control and implementation of the effective movement and storage of related information, goods and services, all the way from the origin to the destination. An effective and efficient supply chain is demand driven and, and, and it's supposed to be customer based. So the development of an integrated supply chain strategy needs to start with an assessment of the present and future supply chain requirements from the customer's perspective. In some cases, an organisation may be required to segment its customers to develop different logistics approach to each of those segments, such as online delivery for younger people and shop delivery for older people. So your question should include customer requirements regarding delivery frequency, windows, inventory levels and fulfillment, the lead times, returns policies and replacement policies, packaging requirements and damage to transportation, product labelling and warehousing. Now stock taking is the, con the counting of any on-hand inventory. This means identifying every item on hand, counting it and summarising the quantities per item. There may also be a verification step where the count results are compared to the inventory unit in the computer system. The two methods of, of um, taking stock is periodic and continuous or perpetual. Periodic stock take is every week or every month, whereas continuous inventory continues to track inventory quantities so that you always know what your stock levels are. You're likely to be using sort of barcodes or things, something like that. And then we've got MRP, which is a planning tool geared specifically to assembly operations. The aim is to allow each manufacturing unit to tell its suppliers what parts it requires and when it requires them. The supplier may be upstream in the process within a plant or outside supplier. We need to remember it's used for de dependent demand items. This is where you'd be buying your directs and where the demand for each component depends on how many of the final products are going to be made. So the only forecasting is in regards to the final product. The number of the number required depends on how many are outlined in the master production schedule. The information into an MRP system comes from five main sources. The bill of materials, the master production schedule, the inventory records that you've got on hand, the purchase order file and the assumed lead time. The bill of materials is a listing of all the raw materials and components or sub-assemblies that's required to produce one unit for a specific finished product. It then multiplies it by the amount that you um, have in your master production schedule. So if you're going to make a thousand of something, it, it multiplies every, of, every one of those bill of materials by a thousand. It will deduct what inventory you've already got on hand and any orders that are due in and it will consider the lead time as well. Your MRP system will form part, it's a, it's a component of your ERP solution and ERP stands for Enterprise Resource Planning. It's a system and software package used by organisations to manage day-to-day -day business activities like accounting, procurement, project management, 
and essentially it ties together a plethora of business processes and enables the flow of data between them. By, by collecting an organization's shared transactional data from multiple sources, ERP systems eliminate duplica duplication and provide integrity within a single source of the truth. And then stakeholders. We have lots of stakeholders, both internal and external. Internal stakeholders are entities within the business, like your employees, managers, and directors. The employee wants to earn money and stay employed. The owners are interested in maximizing profit. Investors are concerned about a return on investment. Your external stakeholders are entities not within the business itself, but who care about or are effective, affected by what your business does. They're consumers and regulators or investors and suppliers. The government wants to play a part because they take the taxes and they want you to employ more people and follow the laws and to truthfully report on your financial outputs. Customers want the business to provide high quality goods and services at the lowest possible cost and suppliers want the business to continue to buy from them. Creditors want to be paid on time and in full and the community wants the business to contribute positively to its local environment and population. Now to differentiate the stakeholders in your supply chain, you need to think about the people, groups and organisations that are affected by the activities that you have. Like I said earlier, they can be internal or external. But to help you identify who they might be, ask yourself, Who's going to be directly or indirectly affected by my actions? Who has the power to influence my decisions? Who is concerned if the project is a success or a failure? Who has a personal interest? Who will benefit? And who could help to solve the problems? Who sets the regulations we must adhere to? And who carries out the related actions? Now, once you've identified who your stakeholders are, a, a model that you can use to manage them is known as the Mendelo's matrix. Merid um, Mendelo. It essentially categorizes your stakeholders based on their level of power and interest, and you'll place them into one of the four categories. So if someone has high interest and high power, they're considered to be key players, and the business will need to actively engage this group. They're likely to have significant influence and may be drivers behind the change or strategy. But they also are likely to have, have the power to stop the change if they're not happy. High interest, low power. This group are interested in what's happening, but they're unlikely to have the power to influence it. They should be kept informed. Whilst they have little power, they could attempt to join a group to, I don't know, lobby or protest. Low interest, high power have the potential to move into the high interest, high power group. So it's really essential that you keep them satisfied. To keep them satisfied, they're less likely to gain interest and exercise their power to influence. And the final box is the low interest, low power. This group is unlikely to have an interest in the organization and direction, often due to their lack of power to influence the situation. They're likely to accept the position and show little resistance. And that's the end of module, um, sorry, learning outcome one. Um, thank you for watching.